So just starting with like, what can I do today so that it can help like future me? Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Before we get into today's episode, I am excited to share that we just launched the new 5-Minute Joy Journal on our shop. So the 5-Minute Joy Journal is a guided journal to help you cultivate joy and gratitude in your daily life. Focus on the good, celebrate your life, and reflect on a new prompt all in just five minutes a day. It's a great way to add journaling to your routine without being intimidating or overwhelming. We've been working on this for the past year, and I'm honestly so excited that it's out. So if you want to check it out, go to shop.lavendare.com. All right, so in today's episode, we'll be covering a few different topics from transitioning your life path to sharing life hacks, how to stick to your routines, work towards your goals, and do things for your future self. And in the end, we also discuss mental health issues that all creators deal with. Our guest today is Maya Lee. Maya Lee is an LA-based YouTuber who loves sharing her quirky and positive attitude throughout her lifestyle videos. She loves sharing her 5 a.m. morning routines, encouraging viewers to move their bodies while also offering life advice. As an only child, she always wished she had an older sister to go through life's challenges with, and she hopes to be that person for her viewers. She was an elementary school teacher for six years before deciding to let it go this summer. Hi, Maya. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. Um, Okay, so first, why don't we talk about how you started making videos? What was like the inspiration? Yeah, so I honestly loved making videos since I was 14 years old. So basically in high school, anytime we had a project, I would always opt to make some type of video to present instead of doing a slideshow and things like that. And so I feel like my love for videos just started really early, but I never thought I would make YouTube videos. I thought, you know, those people are much more extroverted while I'm pretty introverted. So I didn't think that was for me. And then when I started college, I thought about making a video. I remember I posted one of me talking about a beauty product and then some of my friends found it and I was so embarrassed that I took it down. Um, So that was like my first taste of posting anything on YouTube. But then when I started teaching, I oh, because I was an elementary school teacher, I realized I wanted to have something else on the side that was allowing me to have creative freedom. And so I looked into more about what it takes to be a YouTuber, the amount of time it takes, um, some editing skills and things like that. So I posted my first video and I ended up posting vlog type of videos first. And then that was when I realized, you know, with consistency, this can really turn into something. So I was doing YouTube videos and being a teacher simultaneously for about five years. Wow. Okay. Because I I think by now, a lot of people know how much work goes into YouTube and plus you were teaching as a full-time job. So how was it managing multiple jobs at a time, essentially? Yeah. So I think for a while, it just was a part of my lifestyle because even in college, I worked five different jobs while going to grad school. And this hustle mentality was just always in me where I thought, if I can't do it, I'm going to do it. So if I can fit it in my schedule, I'm going to fit it in. Even if that means I get home at like 10 p.m. at night every single day because I'm working, like that's okay with me. So throughout Like my undergrad and grad school, I was just always hustling. So when I was teaching and making videos, I really was trying to figure out, you know, how can I maximize my time? But I was working on Saturdays and Sundays and basically just nonstop working. Um, So it was pretty hard, but I continued doing it every single week for five years. So I posted a video once a week, nonstop. um, And that was just kind of like, pressure I put on myself. No one was really expecting me to do that. I just said, I said, this is what I was going to do and I'm going to stick to it. Yeah. I mean, did you burn out at any point in that five years? Because that's really like an intense schedule for a long time. Yeah. I think whenever I thought about burnout, it was more of if I ever felt like, oh, I don't know if I'm doing a good job and maybe I'm working so hard and it's not reaping what I thought. Um, Those are the moments where I remember I would like either cry or just think like maybe I 
just stop. Um, Mm -hmm. But whenever I tried to stop and like take a break, I would always somehow convince myself, never mind, like she just posted this video that I already like thought of. So I ended up just not stopping or taking a break until now. So I ended up leaving teaching and that was pretty much my first um, step into realizing what rest really means. Yeah. Okay. So what was like the light bulb moment where you realized like you wanted to leave teaching? That's a great question. So, you know, I got my master's in teaching. So I thought this is forever. I am going to be an elementary school teacher. I invested a lot into my education for this. Um, But especially during the pandemic, as teachers, we were really called to um, really step up for our students because we were all at home. They weren't at school and the expectations that were put on us was a lot. And so my workload became a lot more naturally. And at that moment, I realized I'm putting so many hours into teaching. And yet, you know, it's sad to say, but teachers really don't get paid a lot. And so... Mm -hmm. I realized, you know, I'm putting all of these hours into teaching and it was really unfortunate, but a lot of teachers didn't feel appreciated for all the work that we did. But regardless, you know, you don't go into education for the salary. So I was like, it's okay. I'm just going to keep going another year. Um, So that the following year felt a little more normal because we were back in person, but something in me felt like I'm just really unhappy. And I feel like, you know, every day I'm pouring so much of myself and it never feels like it's enough. Like there's Mm -hmm. always more you could be doing for your students. There's always more you could be doing for other people. Um, And so I felt like I wasn't really living for myself. I was living for um, others because every, yeah, like every Sunday when we have the Sunday scaries before you have to go to work the next day, when it was like 3 p.m., I would literally just think about all the lesson plans I have to think of, all the cutting and sorting and things I have to do for my students. Um, And it never felt like, you know, I could just truly enjoy my weekends. So at that point, I thought something needs to change. It sounds like teachers don't definitely don't get enough appreciation. It's such a hard job. And the fact that you're, you're pouring so much of yourself and not feeling like you can refill the cup or get like, it, it doesn't feel like enough in a way. Um, yeah, that that is just unfortunate. <laughs> I don't know if there's like another, like, I mean, just quickly to go on that topic, is there anything that you think we can do? Like, is there a way to like reframe how we think about teachers or something like that? That's a great question. You know, especially with teachers when it comes to their classroom, especially in the beginning of the school year, teachers have like a wish list on Amazon. And it's great if other people could just support and help them, you know, buy borders that they want to make the classroom look cute or just to feel supported. Um, There was one school I worked at where teachers had to buy all of their own paper to print all the worksheets and things like that. So, of course, you know, someone who works in a corporate setting, like they would never have to go off to Office Depot and buy their own paper to print things and things like that. So there's small differences where I don't know why it's almost just expected for teachers to do it and take care of it because it's for the children. And it is for the children and that's why we do it. But it'd be great if, you know, they could feel supported. (laughs) Yeah, especially like your resources and the necessities you need to teach. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Exactly. Um, But yeah, I mean, with education, you definitely feel like you're making a difference every single day. Like every day looks different. Um, And not only are you a teacher, which is something I didn't realize where you know, I thought like, I love teaching math and English and reading, like this is going to be so much fun. Yes, that's true. But there's also this other aspect of you are like a second parent to them and you, some of them see their teachers more than their working parents. And so it's this extra set of pressure to really deliver and show up for them. Yeah. So how would you say the difference in the like how the impact feels to you between teaching and and sharing YouTube videos because you are also a teacher in a way <laughs> in your videos. So how does it feel to you? Yeah. So whenever I see comments on my channel of people feeling like, oh, I've learned so much from you today, or thank you so much for changing, you know, this aspect of my life, I feel like um, 
I don't get to see it with my own eyes. And so it feels a little different. Like I feel like I'm putting myself out there on my videos and saying whatever, um, uh, I guess topics I've, you know, planned out, but I don't really like necessarily see the feedback with my Mm. own eyes. Mm -hmm. I don't see the growth and the change of the people who are watching us, which feels a little different while in teaching, I get to see these kids every single day on the weekdays. Um, So slowly I see them growing, like either physically or uh, mentally or emotionally. So I would miss that aspect, you know, being able to see it for yourself. You also create a bond when you're seeing someone every day on the weekdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. With our viewers, I really wish um, I could see that, you know, to have that connection and and to really see, you know, All right, let's take a break for today's sponsor, Apostrophe. Finding the right skincare products can be challenging, especially when skincare is not one size fits all. When I'm shopping for a new product, not only do I get overwhelmed at all the options out there, but I'm also indecisive, so it's hard to know which products to try first. That's why I'm excited to partner with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team to get customized acne treatments for your unique skin. Simply fill out an online consultation, snap a couple of selfies, and a board certified dermatologists will create your first customized treatment plan with access to oral and topical medications. They offer treatments for all types of acne from head to toe. I'm using apostrophe to improve my skin texture and rosacea. Since I'm in my 30s now, I'm prioritizing my skincare a little bit more. We have a special deal for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash TLL when you use our code TLL. That's a savings of $15. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash TLL and click begin visit. Then use our code TLL at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. So what have you learned from this experience so far transitioning from, you know, doing teaching and YouTube to now moving into your new life? (laughs) Yeah, so... When I knew I was going to leave, it was, so basically I ended up leaving June, which is our summer break. And so when people ask me, you know, how are you feeling? I thought, I feel fine. I feel normal Mm -hmm. because it's summer break. And this is what every teacher feels like. Like we just take, you know, some time to do other things in the summer. And so um, I didn't really feel different Um, And it wasn't until probably about two weeks ago when teachers started going back to school and they started prepping their classrooms and I would see it on my Instagram, I started to feel something's different. And so usually in the summers, I I would travel or plan, um, but this summer I didn't really plan anything related to teaching and it was all YouTube related. But now I am starting to feel a shift in what am I doing and like what's my future going to look like and all of that. And so with teaching, um, I didn't feel like I had placed my identity in it, but last week I did get a little emotional thinking about, wow, I'm not going back to the classroom. And I started to feel a little sad as to like, I feel like I lost a little piece of who I am. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Cause it's, it's hard to not identify with what you've been doing, especially if it's f- fulfilling. Right. So now I, it's like it sounds like an opportunity to redefine yourself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then even with my time, um, I think you know someone asked me last week after teaching, like, "What have you been up to? What is what does your life look like now?" Um, and I kind of felt like, "Well, I don't know. All I do is like clean and cook." I felt like, "Am I wasting my time?" You know that I've been given to um, just kind of chill. <laughs> and I think that comes from constantly doing so much and having a schedule that was planned literally every hour until I go to sleep. Now I do have more time and I can edit my videos when I feel like it. Um, and to have that extra room, I feel like, am I not being productive? Am I not utilizing my time efficiently? Um, even though I know like that's not the case. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I think that happens when you're so used to being like, go, go, go. (laughs) And once you have free time, you're like, who am I? What do I do with this time? 
Um, and I know you even mentioned, you know, sometimes you don't have to have everything planned out. If you feel like doing something that feels good to you, like go do that. Um, but for me, I even this morning, I was like, I don't feel very productive. Maybe I should just plan out like a month goal of like, what am I going to do in this next month? And that'll make me feel like grounded and in control of my life. But definitely, you know, I've learned I'm not in full control of everything that happens. And so it's okay if um, I just take it easy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that been a journey of my own too, is like detaching my productivity from my sense of self-worth. <laughs> I talk about mm-hmm. that on my channel because yeah. so many of us, like we identify with, oh, I feel good if I'm being productive, but you're also just as worthy and you're yourself when you're resting and you need rest. You need that balance in life. Exactly. And um, I. so something that I've been telling myself is just because I can doesn't mean I have to. And so just because I can do something, you know, it's okay to say no. And it's okay to say, I don't think that's what I need to do right now. Yeah. Love that. Um, so on your channel, you do talk a lot about like your own routine and some life hacks. So I want to get into that. So our listeners have some the efficient version of your knowledge. Um, so what are the best life hacks that have changed your life? So one thing that has really impacted me is that small habits create your lifestyle. And so it's really in the little things that we do that really is going to play into some bigger things that we do in life. For example, you know, in my apartment, I have a home for everything. So whether it's my keys or my socks or clothes that are too dirty to uh, hang back up, but not dirty enough to put in the laundry basket. Like, where does that go? Like, I always have a spot for everything. And that's why I tend to not lose things either because I always know where it is. But that kind of organization also trickles into other areas of my life where I organize and have a system for everything. And so I find that, you know, being mindful of those small habits is really important. So instead of just like dropping my clothes on the floor, like I always have a system of where things go. Yeah. I I love that tip. I I actually recently got like a rack in my room. I'm like, this is where I'm putting my in-between clothes. I'm not putting them on a chair anymore. I'm hanging them up so they can still air out (laughs) and it looks better than a pile on the chair. Um, You talked about systems. Um, Do you mean like your to-do list and things like that or... Can you describe more in detail these systems? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in terms of systems, it's more of not so much a to-do list, but just um, having everything thought out as to where things go. For example, clothes, um, having like, these are where the long sleeves are. These are where the workout clothes are. These are, so instead of like color coding it, I just have it where I know exactly where to go to get whatever I need. And that's the same with my um, apartment and things like that. Um, But in terms of systems in our daily lives, it's like finding a routine or a system that works for you. For example, working out is something I find is really important to me and moving our bodies, you know, as often as we can. And some people work out every single day. I found that that doesn't work for me because if I work out really hard one day and the next day I have to go back and work out that hard again, I just feel really tired. And so I found that alternating works better for me and my schedule. And I look forward to my workouts because it's not happening every single day. So when I am there, I work out even harder um, rather than feeling like I'll be back tomorrow. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Um, What is your current morning routine if you have one? Yeah. So I love morning routines. And it's funny because I am a creature of habit, but I think I didn't realize it was called a morning routine probably until I started seeing videos in like 2018 and things like that. Um, But we all do have some type of routine, whether we think it's one or not. For example, some people might wake up and the first thing they do is look at their phone and then they're on their phone for like an hour. Then they watch Netflix. Like that is a routine of some sort, even if it may not look like what you think it is. So for me, my morning routine looks like I wake up in the morning and then I do check my phone to see any like immediate emails I need to answer. And then I'll put my phone away and then I'll usually read my Bible or I'll read a book. And I try to read about five pages because I found that when I was trying to read a chapter a day, I ended up just falling so behind that I didn't even want to open the book anymore. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. So finding a system that works for, works for me and I found that five pages was enough for me to feel like I have enough time to go do other things. Um, so I'll read about five pages and then I'll go off to my workouts and I go to a workout class. And so I have to book it in advance. And if I miss the class, um, then I lose out on the money. Like they don't give you the class back. And so that's another form of accountability because I paid for it. So I have to go. Right. Um, so I'll go work out and then I come back, I shower and I always make a smoothie for breakfast. Um, but it's a loaded smoothie. So it has like spinach, fruit, protein powder, like the whole thing. Um, and so I find that drinking a smoothie first thing in the morning is a great way to fuel my body with everything it needs. Um, and then after that, sometimes I have like a mental checklist. I used to have a physical one on my phone, but sometimes I would get overwhelmed by how many things I would add to it. (laughs) Now I just have like some key things I want to hit today and then Mm -hmm. we'll do it the next day if necessary. In terms of what, like what you want to do in your work, you just keep a mental checklist. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So usually it would be like cleaning or it would be like, what videos do I want to record today or how much of my video do I want to edit today? Um, or is there like a reel or things like that, that I want to record. Um, and then sometimes I'll spend time on social media just to see like, um, what people are up to. Okay. Awesome. Going back to the reading part, do you ever find that the habits that you try to do in your morning, like, like say you, you, you want to read five pages, but you end up wanting to read more and then you take up more time in your morning. Does that happen? And what do you, you know, do you try to prevent that from happening? Cause something like reading, I feel like once I'm started, I could like, like I could take a long time. And sometimes I tell myself, Oh, I want to journal today. And I, I say I'll journal for 15 minutes and it becomes like an hour. <laughs> like, does that happen to you? That's, that's amazing. Honestly. Oh, no. But I'm like, Oh no, I didn't plan to take this long. <laughs> But I think that just gets to show like there are moments where we can just be present with like what you desire. So, you know, I'm sure that our journaling, like you got a lot of stuff out there like on paper and you were able to really think a lot or even with reading, you were able to enjoy that time. So I think as long as you enjoyed it, like that's okay, even if you're off schedule, you know. Um, but for me, I think my brain, it literally runs like a hundred miles per hour. And so I'm constantly thinking of like, okay, this is the next thing I have to do. This is the next thing I have to do. So, so I read my five pages, uh, five five pages, and then I'm on to the next thing. Okay. You never want to like continue. And you're, so basically you're really good at sticking to what you, your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's something I'm also trying to work on being more flexible with myself. (laughs) I'm like on the other end. I'm super flexible where my routine's different every day and I can get caught up doing like one thing for too long. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's crazy because, yeah, like sometimes I'll a lot, you know, like I'll be eating and I'm like, oh, let, let me watch a show. But even like once I'm done eating, I stop the show and then I go clean and then I end up doing something else. So I don't come back to the show. And so, so my husband, he's different. He's like, I want to finish the episode <laughs> before I, can, I get up yeah. and do anything else, which yeah. makes sense. Um, so I'm learning how to like just be still and be present of like, you know, the show, the show is enjoyable. We should just finish it instead of me being like, okay, time to clean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's okay. Everyone's different, right? We're all wired differently. Um, okay. So what about weekly habits? Are there any like daily or weekly habits that are absolutely crucial in your, in your routine? Mm. So one weekly habit that I always have is meal prepping because I feel like when it comes to eating healthy, it's so much easier to have prepared food because sometimes if you get home at like five o'clock and you're like, oh, I have to cook now, I'm going to end up eating like much later than I anticipated. So it's easier to just want to like order food in or like go out and just grab something really quickly. Um, But of course, eating at home, you have more control over what's going into your food and you can also really fuel your body. And so every Sunday I'll meal prep and I always have like a protein, a carb, and then vegetables as well. Um, I know some people who can really just eat protein and carbs, but I'm like, but you need vegetables too. (laughs) And so... um, (laughs) Yeah. So I try to make it a habit to always have vegetables. And then um, a pro tip is to actually freeze your meal prep. And so I put it into Tupperware and then I'll freeze the ones that I know I won't be eating in the next two days or so. Um, So that way it's kind of like a healthier version of a frozen dinner or anything like that. So when you say you meal prep, are you prepping like like one meal together? Because some people prep like like they put all their protein together. You know, they they just 
pre prep like cut veggies or things like that, but you're actually freezing the full meal that you're going to have. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in my Tupperware, I'll have like the full like carb, protein, and vegetable all in one container. So it's like a literal like all in one. <laughs> yeah. You're so efficient. <laughs> Do you get tired of eating it though? Do you ever feel like, oh, I don't want to eat this, but it, you know? Sometimes. So then I try to like change it up because sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, I'm tired of it. Um, so I'll leave it in the freezer because it can last for yeah. like a longer time in the fridge. So then I'll be mm-hmm. like, I'm going to make something else and I'll come back to that later. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, workouts, like working out definitely has changed um, a big part of me and it's really with discipline because it does take discipline to show up and go to the gym and there are many times where I don't feel like going um but you go anyway and you see how much stronger you get and you know that applies in every other area of our lives where you have to meet resistance and you have to meet challenges in order to really kind of break yourself down and and then grow and change (laughs) Right. Um, that's something that I've been getting into too for the past like three or four months is like being consistently working out. Do you have tips for people out there who are struggling with being consistent? I'm sure a lot of people deal with that. How did you build your discipline? That makes sense. So, you know, I think at first it requires finding a workout that you enjoy. And there are so many different types of workouts. Um, and a lot of women especially, I encourage them to lift weights because that is something that is really good for our bone density. And it doesn't mean just because you lift weights, you're suddenly going to become like a super muscular person. Like it takes a lot of eating and a lot of heavy lifting to be like that. And so definitely finding a workout that works for you and then kind of alternating between um, the different styles. So whether it is cardio or weightlifting, like incorporating both and finding a balance is really important. Um, But setting aside a certain time um, in your schedule that works for you is important too. So for me, it's always like either 6.15 or 7.20 in the morning are the two times I tend to work out. I used to work out at night all the time, um, but I realized that was affecting my sleep cycle. And so I was, it was having a really hard time sleeping well because I'd be so pumped from my workout. Yeah. <laughs> um, but working out first thing in the morning, it's out of the way. I don't have to worry about feeling too full from like my lunch or my dinner and things like that. So first is finding a workout that works for you and then finding a workout time that works for you. And three, which I feel is a luxury um, is to have a community uh, to really encourage you because if you know a friend is showing up or is going to be working out with you, you're not going to flake on them and say like, no, I won't go because, you know, they're expecting you. And so having accountability is also incredibly helpful. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So you also mentioned your morning schedule, (laughs) those early morning. Um, I Please share tips for becoming a morning person and waking up earlier for the people who want to do that. Yeah. So uh, for those who don't know, I tend to wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. in order to do what I need to do. And that was more prevalent when I was a teacher because the only time I could really work out was before I taught because afterwards I have to rush home and go edit my videos and things like that. So that was just a schedule that worked for me. But I remember probably about six years ago, um, because I used to work out at night, I was like, I'm going to try going to a 6 a.m. workout class. Like, let me just see if I can do it. So I think I woke up at 5.45. Um, I was nearly late to my 6 a.m. workout. And after that workout, I went to work and I thought, I am never doing that again. <laughs> like, I was so tired at work. And I was like, I don't know how people do this. I don't know how they're morning workout people. But the biggest difference is that you do have to sleep earlier in order to wake up earlier. So you can't expect to keep your, you know, midnight sleeping schedule and then wake up at 5 a.m. and think like, I'm going to be great. Um, We do have to sleep earlier. Um, And I would say the first couple times you try, it's going to be hard and there's going to be a learning curve. Um, So I would say, you know, if you do wake up at 5 a.m. and you're so tired and you're going about your day, if you take a nap, it really affects your sleep schedule too. And so I don't take a nap. And so by the time it's like eight or nine o'clock, the minute my head hits the pillow, I just knock out because I'm so (laughs) exhausted. Um, And then I'm able to wake up early the next day. But I think what's so powerful about waking up at 5 a.m. was that now I feel like I could literally wake up at any time and I'm fine. And so... I was not a morning person 
um, before and I would sleep in until like nine or 10. Um, but waking up at five, I realized, you know, if I have to take a really early flight in the morning and wake up at 3 a.m., like I can do that because I've proven to myself that I can do, you know, difficult things. And so it's really all about like proving to yourself and showing up for yourself of, hey, like you're someone who can do this because you've done this before. While if you wake up at 5 a.m. and then you turn off your alarm and go back to sleep, you've not proven to yourself that, you know, you are someone who snoozes and then you wake up at like 8 a.m. when you wanted to wake up at 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I think that is such a crucial like mindset shift that like, and I, I want to point that out to our listeners, like you have to prove to yourself that you can do it and you only prove it to yourself by by doing it well, like by, by your wins, right? Because like the more you, like if you try and you fail, you try, you fail, you're going to have less confidence that you can do it. And, and that's happened to me before. Like when I've tried to like wake up earlier and I keep like snoozing, like I, I think that is like detrimental to your mindset. So have you ever experienced that? And how do you like continue to either stay motivated to try it or prove to yourself that you can do it? Yeah. Um. So I only set, I'd say usually one alarm or two alarms at most. I don't have a whole list of alarms or I just like have the habit of turning it off because I already know when I wake up, like if I click snooze one more time, like that's it. Like if I go back to sleep, nothing's going to wake me up again. And so um, creating a system that works in your favor. And so for me, it's just setting two alarms where I know after the second one, like if you don't wake up, like that's on you because yeah. there's no yeah. other alarms. Cause I haven't like created um, a system where I think I'm going to need more than that. Um, another example is um, if you feel like you turn it off right away because it's right next to you, then putting your phone or your alarm clock like further away. So you have to like get up. And once you do get up, I like to turn on the lights because I have a hard time sleeping with lights on. So mm -hmm. that just is telling my body like, we're waking up now. We're not going back to sleep. Um, or like, and it's harder to sleep if you're not in your room. So it's like, okay, get up, go to the bathroom, go brush your teeth and do, you know, do things so that you're setting yourself up for success in that sense. But if you're like, I'm just going to crawl back into bed, like we're not really creating an environment of success here because we're just going to go back to sleep. <laughs> right, right. I, so basically for the things that are like, because when you're like in that morning groggy mood, it is so easy to like do what's easy, but you set yourself up for success by like forcing yourself to do what's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like being mindful of, of your future self of like, do you really know like how you would respond to these situations? Because many times we think like, I'm not going to go back to sleep. I'm just going to sit in my bed really quickly and it's going to be fine. But it's like, it's like, no, like, you know yourself, you know, when you get back in bed, you're going to fall asleep. So it's like, don't set yourself up for failure in that sense. So like go off into the living room or somewhere else where you're not going to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love this conversation because I think it, it goes so deep because it's, it's building your relationship with yourself, like knowing yourself and doing something that is good for your future self. It, it's like choosing the, you know, doing what's hard, choosing the future versus like what's, what feels good now the immediate gratification. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like our future self, it's like also finishing your work today if you can, instead of saying, I'm going to do it later because your future self is going to thank you for, you know, not stressing and procrastinating last minute. Yeah. I, I, that's so relatable. And I, maybe it's also because you're a teacher. Like, do you teach this to your kids? Like when you were teaching? Um, yeah, I try to talk to them a lot about like their future selves and just kind of making sure their habits are helpful to them and not putting things off to the last minute because it is all preventable. Like the stress that we feel and all of that, like, um, if it's not external factors, it's like some of it, you know, we can, uh, mediate and mitigate. <laughs> right. Cause procrastination is so prevalent. And so it sounds like you develop a mindset where like, you just don't do that. So, so for the people who, cause procrastination is like, it, it's good for your current self, but not good for your future self. Right. So what are your tips for people who, who have that mindset and want to change it? Yeah. So, um, I think also my mindset is very future oriented in everything that I do. And so if I can take preventative measures from me feeling so stressed out, um, I always choose, you know, 
that route instead. Um, it definitely comes from my own experiences of procrastinating in the past and how it's affected me of like, wow, I was so stressed out because I just didn't start early enough or um, I almost didn't finish or I almost didn't make it on time because I procrastinated. So me knowing, you know, I don't want to feel that way again. Um, and so in those moments where I'm like, I could do it later or I could just get up and do it right now. <laughs> And so it's like, we're always faced with those choices and the choice is yours. Um, and so it's to make that conscious effort of, I'm going to choose what's uncomfortable right now because it's going to be better. And so, yeah, again, like showing up for yourself in that moment. Yeah. I love that. That's, I think that's such a huge lesson. I know it, to you, it might be like second nature, but I think a lot of people have yet to like master that. Mm, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, like as a teacher, literally our school day, every hour was scheduled, like, and the kids have to go where I go. <laughs> it's like, and they have to do what I tell them to do. So every day it was just like, um, even when they were writing essays and whatnot, it's like every day we write and you're writing little chunks, but by the end of the week, they now have five paragraphs, mm -hmm. but they weren't writing five paragraphs all in one day. Like that would be exactly. so exhausting to children, but it's yeah. like, just working on your intro, your first paragraph, and like, look yeah. what you created all week long because mm -hmm. you put in the work every day rather than like the day it's due. <laughs> Cramming it all. Wow. Yeah. I, I, that is a very important lesson. It goes back to what you were saying earlier, like small actions add up over time. It's important to just, right? So, so when you're planning like a big goal for yourself, like, do you break it down in that way? Like, oh, every day I'm just going to do this much. How, what's your system for achieving goals? Yes, a hundred percent. So, um, whether it's like YouTube goals of like, I hope to hit this at some point. Um, yeah, that could be just like in my head of like, that's kind of like the direction I'm going in. But in terms of like, how am I going to execute that? It's definitely in my like monthly, weekly and daily, you know, habits. And like, mm -hmm. what am I doing? So even before this call, I was already like, okay, like what could I do for this month? And then I go back to what does that look like per week? And what does that look like every day? Um, and so just starting with like, what can I do today so that it can help like future me? <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. that. That's actually the same sort of breakdown I have in, I don't know if you've seen like my workbook, the Artist of Life workbook, like we plan the yearly goals, then it breaks down by quarterly, monthly, and then what does that look like weekly? Um, it is super helpful. I think for like, sometimes I forget to, to do that like system though, mm -hmm. but, but yeah. yeah, no, that is so helpful. And I feel like, um, for you to provide a tool where people can be mindful of how to like set goals is so important because, um, many times we don't really know what to do other than like yeah, New Year's exactly. resolutions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do all of your goals look like that where you like break it down week and then every day, you know, like what you're working on? Mm -hmm. So every day um, I work through that. But of course, you know, if some days I don't have the time to work towards it or whatnot, like I give myself grace and I know like even if I don't hit it by the time I wanted to, um, I know like that's okay. Like at least I was trying my best and that's all that really matters at the end of the day. Yeah, love that. Um, how do you balance um, everything that's going on in your life? Let's talk about, like, first of all, how do you define balance? And then I want to know how, how you achieve it in your life. For me, I feel like I'm such a type A um, person where I'm very, like, strict on myself and I do, like, X, Y, Z in this time. Um, but allowing myself to, like, yes, that's good, but you also need this other side of being flexible and being okay with doing nothing sometimes, which I know you talk about, too, of um, and also rest looks different for everybody. So finding out what that means. Um, but all in all, it's like having this extreme personality of wanting to be productive, but this other side of like, but loving life and enjoying what's in front of me. Um, yeah. So I think balance is being able to accept both sides. And also, I think it's what's also helpful is talking to people who are different from me and seeing how they live their lives. Like my husband is co the complete opposite of me. <laughs> he is very <laughs> present, like doesn't really worry about the future, like just yeah. goes with the flow. And so seeing how he lives his life and he seems to be so at peace yeah. that I'm like, huh, I wonder <laughs> what it'd be like if I was like that. <laughs> 
I think as someone who's used to being so productive, it's it's like an interesting experience to see someone not try to be productive, but still be like happy and at peace, right? Like it's possible. Like you don't need to be like pushing yourself so hard. It's possible to just uh, like chill sometimes. Um, but but we're all wired differently. And I think it's for a reason. So it's fine. <laughs> yeah, totally, right? totally. Everyone's like-, <laughs> like, we're all trying to meet in the middle somewhere like and reach that point of balance. Exactly. Yeah. And I, to be honest, like, I don't know what that looks like yet because I feel like I'm still on this other side. But, um, I was talking to my therapist about rest and like what that looks like. And because for me, I would feel like I never truly feel rested mentally (laughs) or emotionally. Um, and then she mentioned, you know, there's a difference between active rest and passive rest. So passive rest could, could be like, sitting on the couch doing nothing or like looking at the sky or watching TV. Like that's more passive. It doesn't take a lot of like um, cognitive behavior from us. But um, some uh, active rest could be, you know, like yoga or stretching or like hanging out with friends. Like that does take energy, but you're not working. You know, you're just having fun and hanging out with people. So that could be like active rest too. So finding the balance between both, like don't just sit on the couch all day long, um, but also don't just go out all the time and then you're just exhausted. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But you do need both kinds of rest. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So try to figure out what that looks like in my life. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When life gets overwhelming, we can get stuck focusing on problems instead of solutions. Overthinking makes it nearly impossible to find peace of mind, which is why it's so important to seek help when we need it. I pay close attention to how I'm nurturing my mind with meditation, journaling, exercise, and BetterHelp online therapy. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is that it helps you tap into deeper emotions and fears that you may be unaware of. A therapist can also help you reframe your mindsets, making it easier to accomplish goals no matter how big or small. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today and get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. Okay, so next I do want to talk to you about YouTube. Um, My first question is now that you're putting all your time to YouTube, what do you plan for the future? Like what are you working towards? Yeah, so to be honest, I felt like, you know, I have so much more time now because teaching was 40 hours, 50 hours a week, and now that's not here. And so you would think, okay, with the 40, 50 extra hours I have, you know, should be doing more with YouTube. But because I post once a week, I felt like, I feel like that's still a good number. So what do I do with all this extra time? Which is why I've been cooking and cleaning. But um, (laughs) um, it sounds great. It's because you you had such a crazy life before. Like now you can enjoy this time. (laughs) Like you're not... You're not spoiled because I feel like I've been like doing this for so long. I, my schedule, like I'm spoiled because I'm used to having this much time, (laughs) but it's all just a perspective. But I mean, you will also have your planners, you have a podcast, (laughs) you do a lot too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think in terms of what's next, I'm trying to figure out the identity of my channel again, because I feel like I've kind of been a hodgepodge of videos where, you know, morning routines are really big in terms of, um, I consistently post things like that. But before then, I also made teacher videos. I also do vlogs. I also do just like random ideas I have. And so I'm kind of figuring out, you know, what does my audience want from me? Um, How can I help other people more um, in terms of like, you know, all the life experience that I've accumulated, um, things like that. But all in all, I think, you know, I'm an only child. And so I've always wanted a big sister. And so if I could be like a big sister to someone, um, that means a lot to me. So trying to figure out, you know, how can I push content where people feel like they can get to know me and know that they're not alone? Um, It's something that that I'm trying to, yeah, (laughs) I'm trying to figure out what that looks like. Yeah. I, it's interesting because I think it's, 
like the platform is so open that you can choose to be like a super niche channel or you can choose to be just like a big sister. And I feel like big sisters talk about a little bit of everything, right? From dating to this to this. So it, I, it really is up to you. And then my next question is, as a creator, it, I, I also do feel like it's always a balance between like what you want to make and what your audience wants to see. Do you feel that tug and pull or do you put more emphasis on what the audience wants to see or what you want to do? Yeah, that's a good question. So I definitely know like my subscribers really like my morning routines and they mention it too of like, when's your next morning routine video and things like that. Um, but yeah, there are moments where I'm like, you know, I can do like seasonal morning routines, but I don't know if it's something I would post like on a weekly basis. Exactly. You know? You're like, I don't want to make yeah. another one. I already made one. Yeah. 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 Cause I'm like, yeah. it, it literally looks exactly like okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, but I feel like the audience just wants to see it again in a different day, mm-hmm. like different version. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I try to figure out, you know, how can I do it where it's still entertaining for people, where they want to keep coming back, and that it's also like still fun for me to do too, because um, I don't want to just feel like, oh, here we go, <laughs> like same, yeah. same goal, same shot, same, t- yeah. I feel like that too sometimes. Okay. Like what, what you want to do or what, what people want to see. Yeah. So I think all in all, it would be, um, I want to push out more vlogs too, of just like my daily life, um, which would incorporate morning routines too. But I feel like then people can really get to know me and just all the random thoughts I have in my head. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I'm working on that. And then, yeah, but I do feel like you know, I worry about the future of YouTube, not in terms of the platform, but in terms of like for me and my life of, because I just got married. So I'm like, you know, when I'm 40 or 50, like, would I still be making videos? And that's not because I, I don't want to or anything like that, but it's just more of, would it even be possible? <laughs> Yeah. I think it comes down to, I mean, first you have to clarify, like, do you mean you, are you going to make it like continue it as a career at 40 and 50 or like you just want to make videos for yourself? Cause I think YouTube can always be a hobby, but is like career wise, it is a question. And I think about that for myself too. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, for a career in terms of, um, you know, having it be my only source of income and all of that. It's like a little scary um, because it is a business and you are working for yourself in that sense, Um, but it's dependent on your viewers and the people who support you, um, which, you know, it's a very vulnerable state to be in. And so when I am 40 or 50, like I'm sure like just as much as I'm changing, like my viewers will be changing too, um, which is like a scary thought. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I think creators are always thinking about this and that's why I have like my shop because I do want to lean more on like selling products as like partial income because it's, you can't rely on social media platforms. Like they change so fast. The algorithm changes. I, like who knows what'll happen in 10 years, right? Yeah. So, which is like, so scary. It is scary. <laughs> I think a lot, yeah, this is something creators have to deal with is like the fact that it can be so unpredictable and change so fast. Um, yeah. But I think if you're confident in your ability to like create and also connect with people, which you have been doing, I think that skill kind of translates beyond YouTube, right? Like you, if whether it's a new platform or whether it's even like like marketing a product or something, I feel like you have you've built the skills for you to be able to like sustain yourself. That's true, and you know I was gonna ask you like as a creator, which I feel like I'm sure other artists feel this way too. But do you ever fear like all your subscribers are one day just gonna like all disappear? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it, I think this. Once you let, I think once I hit a million subscribers, it was like, is this all going to (laughs) crumble? Like, yeah, well, it's not like a major fear, but it was, it's, it's like a thought that pops up in the back of your mind. And then I did have like, and there was like a few years, I think in the beginning when you're hustling really hard, building your channel, you're so focused on the, the, the growth of the numbers. And I was really focused on like 
you know, keeping check with the numbers and making sure they're growing, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like you can get a little too obsessive about that where it's not good yeah. for your mental health. Cause like if anything dips, totally. then your, your feelings dip with it. And that's when I realized, mm-hmm. oh my God, I tied my self-worth with like the, the success of the numbers on YouTube, whether it's views or subscribers. And then, and then you have that anxiety of like, oh my God, if it all goes away, like what happens to me? And, and that's, in my journey, I had to detach my sense of self-worth from my external success because I had to know that even if it all went away, I'll be okay. Like I want to genuinely feel at peace if it's all gone. And I do feel like I'm closer to that now, especially since I, I mean, in the past couple of years, I've been less consistent with my channel. I've watched numbers go down, especially like Instagram, right? Because TikTok has changed so much. And I had to learn as a creator, you have to learn to be okay with and recognize that things will go down. And it doesn't mean you can be able to bring it back up because like it's like believing in yourself enough that I can restart this if I want to. And it's, even if it goes down, it doesn't make, it doesn't mean I'm a failure. It doesn't define my worth. Yeah, it you is, just spoke like internal. straight into my soul. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I know this is something all creators deal with. And I, I went, this is what I've been going through and trying to like detach and heal from the past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so true, especially about the numbers and not letting it affect you because it's like you pour your heart into this video. You really enjoyed making it. You post it. And then within the first 24 hours, you can already see your analytics of like, how's it ranking? How's the watch time? And then you, there's so many like stats to look at that yeah, really like, can like define it, you. What's that word? You can get so like, it feels so good. It's almost like a drug where you're like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. It's, like it's a hit a of little, dopamine. It's just exactly. like, yeah. Exactly. And that yeah. is it's like it feels good in the moment, but essentially it's it's not good. It's kind of like when people are gambling. They're like, oh, this feels good. I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning. And then once you start losing, you feel horrible. And then you like it is like a, a spiral in both directions, right? Totally. So it's unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And I feel like it really does affect our mental health. And of, of course, as creators, we're also so thankful that we even get to have this problem and get to like see, you know, our channel growing or dipping because it's like it's coming from a place where it can even go down. Like, <laughs> But exactly. You have I to can. be grateful in, in hindsight that it, it's gone so, f- you know, it's grown so much that it has space to go down. <laughs> It, well, that's why I also think it's so beautiful in the beginning because you have nowhere to go but up, right? And that's why it's so when you just start something, not just a YouTube channel, but anything in life, like it's, I think it, there's beauty in that because you're naive, you don't know that much. And then, yeah, all, like the only way, the only direction you can go is up because you know nothing. Yeah. You're, you're on, on the bottom. Um, this is also exactly. something I've seen. Like I, I think I've been on the platform long enough to see like the wave of YouTubers and the the kind of was lifetime of a channel. I've seen like the trajectory of some channels because I've started YouTube in like 2008 with a music channel, and I started laughing there in 2015. So I've been like watching YouTubers for a long time, and you kind of see this like trend where. Like you, I'm sure you've seen channels on YouTube that blow up really fast. And maybe your channel was also one of them where you just had like mm-hmm. rapid growth, like for one year where things just pick up there. Like, yes, I think channels get lucky where maybe there's a point in time where like the algorithm likes you, like you did mm-hmm. something well, it ke- you, you continue that. And so a lot of young channels, they're used to that level of growth, but it just means that your channel popped off on YouTube. You, the algorithm mm-hmm. liked you. And then after that, there's always like, you know, you can't continue that forever. And there's always mm-hmm. this like plateau and then maybe even st- like start to dip. And I I know that creators are always like, what am I doing wrong? What's like, uh, it's not working anymore. And there's like so much anxiety and fear when in reality, you're not doing anything wrong. In fact, your videos are probably the same, if not better. It's just the algorithm stopped favoring you. And so- I know that's affecting people's creative minds, like it just everything mental health related. But I, after seeing it so many times and experiencing it myself, I'm like, that's just something that social media platforms do. And and people don't, I don't think people realize it. They think they're doing something wrong, but you're not, it's not you, it's the algorithm. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause it's, yeah, because it's always also like in search of like the next thing that is popular or trending and that it's going to favor them. 
if you happen to make like a really good video and then you happen to like continue making videos similar to that, then your channel is going to like pop off for the algorithm in a way where it just grows really fast. But, but like I said, it's like, you can't expect humans to be like machines where they just continue to like, first of all, you don't even know exactly <laughs> what is going to like, is it even possible to sustain that growth for that long? I don't yeah. know. But, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen it happen many, many times over, over and over again. That that like graph, what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just interesting. Yeah, and just to know that it's normal and that provides so much exactly. peace. It's not you know, just for, you. Yeah. It's it happens to everybody, and and because this happens to people who are young and they don't really know what's happening, they think oh, my channel had been growing at this rate. It's it's supposed to keep going or get even better, but that's not true. Like kind of have like this golden window of opportunity sometimes on YouTube, but it doesn't mean you can't recreate it again, but just know that it's just a window. It's not, it's not like your status quo. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, I feel like (laughs) Uh, it's so hard to because definitely um, I can tell you it's so hard out of your control. Yeah. And like for you, I know like you did a lot of deep work into knowing, you know, where your identity lies and it's not in the numbers or the stats. So being able to look at your channel objectively of, you know, this is okay and I'm okay. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm still learning. <laughs> I get it. I, it, it. It'll take time. Um, and I also think it's like putting your focus and attention not towards like the things that you can't control because like the numbers and how the algorithm picks you up, you can't control that but you can control how good you want your videos to be, right? You can control the quality of your work. And if you make a video that you're proud of, that should be the the thing you focus on. Like, oh, I feel proud that I made that. It's out there. And then once it's out there, I'm not going to think about it. (laughs) Like, I'm just proud that I made it. And that's because that's within your control. Yeah, that's true. But how do you feel about like, YouTubers or creators like taking a break or even for you, like taking a break or maybe not posting a video for a little bit of time? Like, how do you feel about that? I I support it. And I understand it's the scariest thing because you know, if you take a break, then you're, you don't have the same momentum. So you have to be okay with not ha- like breaking the momentum in order to take a break. Number one, you have to be okay with that. Like knowing, okay, things could go down and people won't come back if I take a break. But I think most like audience people, like the audience, they understand (laughs) that you need a break. Like social media is the only career where like we're go, go, go. And we don't take a break. Even teachers take summer break and movies, TV shows, they always have like seasons, right? So it's like, it's such an impossible expectation for us to like go, go, go nonstop on this unending hamster wheel. And I, it's, you know, a lot of people go into being a content creator because they want freedom in their life. They want flexibility. But there was a point in time where I'm like, wow, I am not free. Like I am stuck to the schedule of creating every week. And like, it, it's almost like, why am I on a hamster wheel? I'm supposed to, <laughs> I'm supposed to have the freedom to do whatever I want with my life. And so that's why to me, I've started becoming less strict with myself in, in fitting that schedule. But that's because it's a luxury because I've reached a certain point where where I yeah, feel like I can do okay. that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. everyone's different depending on what what you what you value, I guess. But I think breaks are necessary <laughs> and super important. Yeah, for sure. And like, it's crazy because I feel like these are things like all creators think about and worry mm-hmm. about. Um, so especially anybody who's like thinking of being a content creator or they are one right now, um, you know, I'm sure they really empathize with like all of these feelings. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. It's so much like anxiety and uncertainty and fear goes into, it it exists, right? Yeah. And like, but then I also have to remind myself, like this job is different. Like this career is very different, but also like a lot of other jobs, you know, it can induce a lot of anxiety or uncertainty and, and a lot of other jobs are hard too. So it's like choosing our hard (laughs) Basically, yeah, nothing's perfect. There's always something you're going to have to deal with. So choosing what is worth it, like the difficulty that feels worth it to you. And and at the very least, I think this career is worth it. Yeah, Yeah. 100%. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) 1,000%. 
Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Any any last words or any last thoughts that you want to share before we sign off today? Yeah. So um, again, I really thought teaching was forever until I realized, you know, um, I could possibly use the time I've been given to do something else and to work towards something else. And I think that was a really scary reality. Um but we are blessed to be in a time where there's a lot more options than there were before. And so for anybody who wants to create change or they feel like they deserve better, you know, go after it because I knew like I deserve better, but I'm afraid. Um, so being able to take a chance on myself and to show up for myself um, is worth it and it's going to be worth it. So if anybody else in that same boat, I encourage you to just take that jump and do it. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Maya. Where can we find you online? Thank you. You can find me at Maya Lee on YouTube and then on Instagram and TikTok. It's Maya Lee X3. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Bye.